I think we have some time for another set of questions here. Uh, it is very interesting that you pointed out that Brazil has a, a regional leadership role and that it will have a influence on the countries around it and other countries beyond the regional sphere of being connected territorially. Uh, yet, there, that can be misconstrued to imply that Brazil has to integrate politically with other countries, that the region has to be controlled or has to be uh, politically uh, the same with a supranational power, be it Mercosul or be it directly from the UN. And that type of narrative has been pervasive, even in our military. Our military, they actually believe that Brazil, many of them, believe that Brazil, Brazilian borders cannot be protected. There are 16, 17,000 kilometers of Brazilian border, and those cannot be protected because it's very wide and it costs too much money to do that. Uh, at the same time, the proposal or the narrative that we need a strong foreign policy that determines uh, clear immigration patterns has to be uh, put in place to protect borders from narco trafficking, terrorism, and also widespread migration, economic migration that violates the citizenship of those that pay taxes and pay for the whole structure to be viable. I'll give you an example. Considering that we still do not have a very uh, clear foreign policy in the North, there has been a widespread migration from the Venezuelan uh, border. And our, all of our indices of health and security have gone down the drain. I've heard reports that we are now Africa level of uh, AIDS contamination in the state in the north. That has not been publicized yet. I overheard it in the government. And that is a real concern because we have the idea that we have to integrate as a region. So we need to develop a new narrative as far as maintaining the national sovereignty, maintaining the value of our citizenship. However, still be able to influence positively on these countries that are bordering and not create a xenophobic regime or a xenophobic foreign policy. There's a very thin line that we need to establish. And that I think is the culprit because if we do not establish that clearly, we fall within the previous narrative, which is we need to integrate, we need open borders, we need to accept everybody and pay for those that cannot pay and just ruin our economic system, ruin our social system. Uh, so that's one of the, the real challenges here. At the same time, uh, while we project ourselves outside of this region, Economically, I think in Iran, for instance, in the case of Iran, and I've heard a few reports, and you might correct me, but I think Brazil exported over $2 billion worth of grain, yet it imported less than $100 million, less than $50 million from Iran. So any political change that we, or any political war that we decide to venture ourselves into, there will be a net loss for Brazilians. And I'll go back into 91. In 91, when George Bush set up the coalition to establish a blockade uh, against Iraq, because Iraq was invaded, Kuwait, Saddam, exactly. Iraq invaded Kuwait, and then there was a national blockade. He, he called for a national coalition. Brazil had over $2 billion, that's in 1991, dollars, two billion ninety ninety one dollars uh, of trade with Iraq, positive trade. And because we did not have, I would assume, a clear vision for our national, for protecting our national sovereignty, at the same time our national interests abroad, we simply said, well, okay, well, we will not make two billion, that's what cost us economically, $2 billion. So I think we are at a, 
at a stage where United States and other powers that want our help will need to help us also in establishing clear national policies for foreign policy on, on immigration and also how do we project ourselves and establish a at least maintain our sovereign interests considering that uh, we might lose economically on these other fronts. So just would like to share this with you. I think these are might be my ending remarks. I'm not sure about the time here, but I'll pass the word for you if you have any comments. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. They will tell us. Thank you. Wonderful questions. I have learned myself. I teach. I'm a professor. But I have learned to learn over the years that every assertion that is made to us as citizens, as decision makers, as opinion makers need to be questioned. So you have an elite, academic elite. This is where it all starts. I know that there was a professor, a great uh, speech by how the classrooms, the universities, the high schools are the place where our foreign policy is made or broken are the place where our defense policy is made or broken. Because from the classroom, at least in America, in the United States, who graduates from the classroom? Those who are going to be writing the articles of the New York Times, in the Washington Post. Those who are going to be the newsrooms. I am very familiar with newsrooms. I go on TV every day almost in, in America. So my point here, my friends, is that not every projection that is projected in the media is something, oh, we're going to flow with it because it was just projected in the media. And I know how talking points are produced in the media. Question it. The real battle, before we go to the borders of Brazil, before we go to the immigration issue, before we go to what we're going to do with the Middle East, all these important themes, the real battle is a war of ideas. It happens here inside the head. So. First, we need to challenge the premises. First, we need to challenge the veracity, the facts. So it's not just about fake news. There's a fake narrative that is imposed on us that would force us to think, and not just to think in terms of domestic issues, but in foreign policy as well. This is the preamble. Now, quickly, with regard to defense of borders, I don't want to challenge any military leader, neither here nor on the US, nor anywhere else. They have their own assessment. But we know, it's not a secret anymore, that technology is changing. The borders, when the Capitanias were moving in your own history, were one thing. The borders, when you had a national army, where every nation here had a national army over the past maybe 150 years, where you have to put a post in every single place, is another thing. And today, we have something that is developing at the speed of an hour called the drones called the technology, called the satellite. My friends, as long as these borders are not just in Brazil, but in the United States, and you know, we have a problem with borders in the United States, but Russia, China, Pakistan, India, the next generation of defending the borders is not going to be putting military divisions on the border. It's all going to be there, real space and cyberspace, and then you respond to the challenge when the challenge happens. So that takes care of the first talking point. Second talking point is about immigration and migration. We in the United States are living what I call the wall era. It's a song by Pink Floyd, but in fact, we are living now the, the, the issue of we have to put a wall. That's what the president has promised. But the wall is not because it's a wall. It translates a vision that is, we don't want any radical force to organize any demographic move that would affect our homeland and our national security. That's the translation of what's the wall. The wall has gotten endorsement in the United States, not because we like walls. I personally, I don't want any wall. I want people to respect the law. I don't want even forces on the borders, if it's possible. If the education of people is sane in the classroom, I would not break the law. But we're not there yet. So what we have in North America, you have it in South America. There are waves of people who just cross borders. And I distinguish between two types. Those who are humanitarian, to just flee. I, 
you know, was born in Beirut, Lebanon, and Lebanon had a lot of problems, and many people have fled from many places to other places. I know what it is. So you have one wave which is humanitarian, and you have another wave, another type, which is when radical, you could call them far left wing, you could call them neo-Stalinist, you could call them, we in the Middle East, we call them jihadists. It's the same. It's basically manipulates a demographic tragedy into a political weapon. That needs to be addressed. So if there is a crisis in an area, the response by a responsible government is to associate its national authorities and if possible, international aid, but that's it as a limitation, to address that problem at the border. There is no reason that waves and waves will come and change the demography and the economy and the identity of a country under the pretext and pretense that we have to open because of a humanitarian issue. If we want to be humanitarian, first of all, we'll help them at the border with everything we can. Real response is to change what's happening there inside that country, is to address the root causes, is to tackle evil that they are freeing. So my long-term answer is that why do people have to run that way through borders to another country? Fix matters in these countries. Now we have President Bolsonaro and his government here. Let's have many Bolsonaros across Latin America. And it's true for the whole world. And we need to have a strategic vision of the matter, not fall immediately as victims of a TV station making a speech or some professor making an academic statement. We are way beyond that. And you know why? Because of this. In the past, that would tell us anything in a controlled TV station, and we had to subscribe. Now, any statement made by Trump or Bolsonaro or anybody is discussed for 10,000 tweets to get legitimacy. Thank God we have this. So the issue of refugees need to be approached in a different strategy. The coordination between the responsible governments of Washington and Brasilia need to be tight on, on this matter. Actually, Brazil can help the United States at, at this point. Thirdly, foreign policy. I know that Brazil had had over the past many decades interests around the world, so did the United States. The United States used to be depending on oil coming from the Gulf, on oil coming from the Arab world. In 1973, Europe and the United States were on their knees almost because of the the, uh, the OPEC tightening of oil import or export for, for the United States. We learned the lesson. So we opened drilling in America and now we are the greatest exporter of oil and energy in the world. So what we need to do, what a foreign policy of a country that is changing needs to do is look at the long term and see how we can be sufficient, how our alliances can help us. So we're not gonna, you're not going to get oil from, uh, say, a country, Iran? Well, Libya is waiting for you, better quality oil. You, I'm just giving an example. There are many ways for a country to have a foreign policy that is not stuck. And many, in many cases, the reason for why we are stuck is because there are interests involved in that situation. Those who deal with the economic relationship will come to the country, Brazil or America, and say, oh, we only have to do business with this regime, even if they kill all their people, or even if, even if they send all the terrorism overseas, because we have interests, because our companies have interests. That is a challenge that we need to bypass. We need to help our economic interests to be smart, to be swift, to adapt to the situations. But the good news is way beyond that. And I'm concluding on the third point. We need to have a foreign policy across the hemisphere. So what's right for you is right for us as well. That would be a little bit predictive. Not live day to day. That's why I, I just gave the example of your, of your foreign minister. I had the chance to speak with him in Washington and, and, and here, and he went on Fox uh, first foreign minister, you know, since the election that went on Fox News and developed ideas. The, the, the issue here is that we can predict what is going to happen. So, with regard to Iran, for example, which is a matter that Brazil deals with, number one, trade with Iran as long as Iran wants to trade. 
put sanctions if you want to be close to the United States as long as you, you know, you want this relationship to happen. But at the end of the day, look at what's happening inside Iran. That's why you need experts to understand the region. I don't think this regime is going to last there for very, very long. And I'm not part, I'm not Iranian, I'm not part of the Iranian opposition. But when you have women rising, when you have a demonstration in 2009, the Green Revolution in Iran, 1.5 million demonstrators in the streets of Tehran, 60% of whom were under the age of 20. When you have now protests across Iran, this is a domestic affair to Iran, but do your analysis based on, is it gonna last or a new society that would look like us, that would trade with us, that would work with us, is going to be very soon our partner. I think a right foreign policy would be between two points. One point, doing the best we can to maintain our interests, but keep an eye on our long range interests and let the best interests be in the best conditions of the country we are dealing with. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure talking to you. I hope we had another six hours and, and a little bit more water. We can, we can have this a very long discussion. Muito obrigado a todos de terem escutado. Acho que esse, esse assunto de, de um, relações exteriores está crescendo no Brasil. Mais brasileiros estão entendendo a interação dos agentes externos como isso afeta também a nossa política interna e como nós, como ele mencionou aqui, muito claramente, which you mentioned, we need more Bolsonaros in the region. Nós precisamos mais Bolsonaros na região, e isso é fato, porque o atual presidente representa a população contra um sistema que não foi criado para representar a população, mas sim para governar e controlar a população. Então, é uma ruptura que nós estamos vivendo assim. O atual presidente Bolsonaro tem a missão de criar essa ruptura e eu também desejo, assim como ele, mais Bolsonaros na região para que liberte o povo dos sistemas que foram criados. Muito obrigado a todos. Muito obrigado. obrigado. Luiz obrigado. Felipe, Vale de Ferros. Muito obrigado. Muito obrigado. Muito obrigado. Muito obrigado.